So this is actually a cave drawing, um, an Aboriginal cave drawing. So it's about 28,000 years old. And I think it shows that the Aborigines realised the importance of hands. And this is going to be a recurring theme in my presentation. Really, the, the primacy of hand function separates us from other mammalian species, but it's also a potential design flaw that may predispose us to neurodegenerative conditions. So um, it's great to be here in Cardiff, and uh, it reminds me a lot of Sydney. And uh, <laughs> the weather's obviously better in Cardiff than Sydney. And um, as, as Pam said, um, I spent four great years uh, in working in the UK, um, in Queen Square, in the hospital initially, and then doing a postdoc. Um, and I think the connections with the ABN and the um, positions that are offered for Australian and New Zealand trainees is really superb. And, and everyone virtually in Australia has been passing through institutions in the United Kingdom to Australian neurology's benefit. And these are uh, my um, colleagues in predecessors in Sydney. So the four of them there are all Bushel professors of neurology, and they all had long periods working in the United Kingdom. So the first one is, uh, I don't have a, a pointer, but the one in the second to the left is Jim McLeod, who initially, um, as well as doing his clinical neurology, um, did animal experimental work um, in neurosciences and was also the captain of the Oxford uh, boat crew that won. Um, then we've got John Pollard, who's next to him, and David Burke. And we've all really benefited from working, working you know, collaboratively with the ABN. And uh, the pleasing thing now is actually in the last couple of years we've been able to put positions back in Australia for British trainees to come over to Australia. So hopefully we can repay some of the um, hospitality. Now the um, other thing that uh, I would like to mention is, is the Journal of Neurology and Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. Um, it's got a very strong connection to the ABN. And I would just mention some of the things that are useful for, for trainees, um, although I did see one of the posters um, that was out there, poster eight, said what happens to um, research that's presented in the ABN, and by far and away, most of the research is published in JNNP. So um, that was great to see. And the, each month, we choose an editor's choice and a patient's choice. These are freely downloadable, and we try and get um, the authors to, to speak to us, to try and give us some background to their, their work. And these podcasts are being undertaken by Harriet Vickers, and she's actually here at the meeting today and doing podcasts. So if any of you have some interesting thoughts or controversial ideas, then we'd love to record them today. The other good thing about uh, JNMP is working closely with practical neurology. And this really teaches us all how to be neurologists. And I think Geraint and Phil, and before them, Charles Warlow, I mean, it's just a magnificent sort of uh, combination of, of journals to, to work with in, in the BMJ group. And it's a very strong relationship. The BMJ really values the input of um, the ABN. In fact, at this meeting, there's representation, including the journal manager, Claire Langford. And you know, I think these journals are really, uh, have grown out of um, the ABN. So relevant to today's uh, presentation, we're also trying to look back on what, what's been successful. What are, the, what are the manuscripts that have done well? And um, here's an example of the uh, NERI paper with frontal lobe dementia, motor neuron disease. And this has become a citation classic. And if, if the authors of these citation classics are around, we're getting them to sort of put the backdrop into how this study came about, why they did it, and what the impact of that has been. We've also... Um, been with the various podcasts trying to work together across the journals and in fact the most successful podcast is a recent one which uh, Phil and uh, Andrew Lees um, did also with uh, Oliver Sachs looking at the uh, neurologist as a detective and if you haven't if you haven't listened to it I'd commend it to everyone it's it's very uh, very entertaining um, some of these impact commentaries, I mean, one of the strengths of JNMP is it's coming up to 100 years now, and it had been started by Kinnear Wilson. And we saw yesterday Michael Hutchison's talk, the role of Marsden being there for 10 years. And I think what's happened then is a lot of the classic manuscripts have been published in JNNP and they're still getting heavily cited. So this um, Hamilton Depression Scale has got almost 16,000 citations. 
And um, I think it is very instructive to go back and try and work out you know, why things are successful. And um, the other strange thing, uh, this will probably split the audience, is that uh, like all journals, we've gone into social media, and I don't know, really know what that means at this stage. But we're trying to look at, you know, if, if, if manuscripts do go out into to social media, how does, does that make them more, you know, does it have a greater impact? And these are sort of things that uh, are being worked out. But I would say that, that the JNMP is tweeting from the ABN, and uh, you can get any updates there. That's the uh, hashtag. So that's, that's all of the uh, disclosures. Um, now, in terms of um, trying to understand motor neurone disease, I mean, all things have a beginning, and I'm not really sure what the real beginning is, but certainly the person who's connected most with motor neurone disease is, is Charcot, and I think that's an important um, quote that he gives there. But he, uh, he saw about 13 uh, motor neurone disease patients in his entire career, but he followed them in great detail, he described them clinically, and he looked at them pathologically. And I think his great contribution was really actually coming up with a term, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, so showing that this was a disease across two compartments. So the amyotrophy, the muscle wasting and weakness with anterior horn cell loss, and then he noticed that there was thickening or hardness on um, the lateral portions, which is the corticospinal involvement, the lateral sclerosis. And I think um, after Charcot's work, it was relatively dormant for quite a long period of time, up until the late 80s, early 90s. And I think a, a, a clear breakthrough was the discovery of the SOD1 mutation. And that led to trying to understand what, what exactly was SOD1 doing and how was it involved. And this is some of the important work that Pam undertook and also um, Jeff Rothstein, looking at um, glutamate in patients, seeing that it was upregulated and coming up with an excitotoxicity theory that somehow the motor neuron is kicked off, it is overactive, it releases glutamate, the glutamate is toxic and that causes the neurodegeneration. Now that led in part to the discovery of a neuroprotective treatment, Rilizol, and it's still really the only neuroprotective medication available in, in neurology. Unfortunately, we haven't come up with any um, more significant treatments, and, and this is something that we'll, go, we'll talk about in, in a moment. But I think um, the other clear benefit for MND patients is to be managed in a specialist center. And this was actually a study by Ola Hardiman and her colleagues in Dublin, showing that if you went to a multidisciplinary clinic, if you look at the 50% cutoff on the, on the right, patients were surviving an extra three, 300 days. And that was actually increased when you added neuroprotective therapy. And I think that's an important message. These patients are very difficult to deal with and they need strong input. And it's not the type of input that is easily done in a, for instance, a private practice environment. And they, they really do benefit from having case management. Now, another sort of clear benefit that has, has developed over, uh, become understood over recent years is the input of respiratory support, particularly non-invasive ventilation. And again, Pam um, and Tim Williams, working with their respiratory colleagues, showed that non-invasive ventilation improves survival in patients with motor neurone disease. It also improved their quality of life. They feel so much better. They have less fatigue, less headaches. One question that is still out there is, you know, when should we institute the respiratory support? Now, the other clear boom that came out with uh, the discovery of SOD1 was the development of an animal model. And from that, we can work out all the different pathways of neurodegeneration. And that was certainly a critically important step. But I suppose uh, now we need to sort of work out whether that was a clear benefit or not. And, I, and the question that is generally being raised is, have we sort of lost our way a little bit? And what do I mean by this? And this is the meeting that Pam mentioned. We discussed the various controversies um, in motor neurone disease. And one of the ones is, has this model really out, outlived its usefulness? And I think probably on the balance, it, it may well have done so. So why, why do I say that? Well, the critical issue is now, there's been about 150 positive studies in the SOD1 mouse, and not one of those studies has translated into a treatment for patients. And in fact, the Riliazol study was a study in humans first before it was brought back to do a study in, uh, in the SOD1 mouse. 
Now, it's a very unusual phenotype. It's pure, it's virtually purely lower motor neurone. It's got a very aggressive disease course. And in the, why, why were the animal studies positive when the patients weren't? Well, generally, the treatments were given soon after the, the mouse was born. And unfortunately for us, with patients, we can't do that. We don't know when, who's going to get motor neurone disease um, and when is it going to develop. But I suppose critically, the SOD1 model is not associated with TDP43 inclusions. And so for those reasons, I think there's a clear need to come up with better sort of strategies to try and investigate the disease. And that brings us to what, what we can all do. I think the clinical information that we can gather on these patients, the better chance we have of actually coming up with an appropriate treatment. So what should we do? Well, the other person who's intrinsically linked with uh, motor neurone disease is Lou Gehrig. I'm not sure if we can get any volume for the video, but this is his farewell uh, speech at Yankee Stadium. I don't know if you can put the sound on for the video. But he's um, being presented with a um, medallion by his, uh, that's Babe Ruth. Um, they'd had a number of fights, but with Gehrig's diagnosis, they uh, managed to patch up. You can see here, when he's starting to walk across, he's, he's limping. And we'll just see more for a bit, but then we'll, we'll move on. Um, so I suppose, what does Lou Gehrig sort of, you can see he's, he's limping on his, on his left leg. What, what, why, why am I showing that video? Well, really, I think um, Lou Gehrig shows what other patients with the condition have. It's, it's a focal onset. And it's actually very interesting. If you give patients a picture of just a pro forma schema of a body, they can pinpoint where the condition began. And this is sort of exemplified by uh, a study that was done on, on Gehrig showing that in the year he was diagnosed, he could still hit the ball out of the baseball park, but he was dropping off on the singles. He couldn't actually run to first base. So generally, uh, motor neurone disease begins with focal weakness. Um, and it's most predominantly focal limb weakness. But if you can't just look at the, the top two areas, limb weakness and bulbar weakness, it's going to account for about 85 to 90 percent of presentations. Fasciculations are a very rare presentation of motor neurone disease. They're an inevitable part of the condition itself, so it's fasciculations with weakness and wasting, but just isolated fasciculations is rarely a feature of motor neurone disease. And I suppose the reason I raise this is that most of the people who present for investigation of fasciculations are clinicians. And so we've called this the FASIC syndrome, fasciculation anxiety syndrome in clinicians. And we've followed this uh, cohort up now for more than 10 years. In fact, the most common um, physician trained with the background are neurologists. So I think that's why I'm uh, hoping to reassure you We've all got fasciculations, and when we followed up this cohort over an extended period, none of them developed motor neurone disease. But it's the fasciculations in the context of wasting and weakness. Now, one of the other big problems with ALS is we don't have a definitive diagnostic uh, test. Clearly, things are moving along rapidly, and we'd often get these sort of MRI scans, and you would see the uh, signal change in the corticospinal tract. And a number of people around the world, and particularly Martin Turner working here in Oxford, um, have been pioneering this work to try and get better uh, metrics on the corticospinal tract. And, and it's, I think it's almost inevitable that this will form part of a better diagnostic approach for uh, motor neurone disease. So this is, a, I would say, a typical hand of motor neurone disease, and it's, it's very unusual. So the first dorsal interossei is wasted. You might think, okay, this is an ulnar nerve uh, lesion. But in fact, the ADM is completely preserved. So it's not a, an ulnar problem. The other strange thing is APB is, is wasted. So could this be a C8T1? Well, if it was C8T1, then you'd expect some involvement of ADM. So it's not spinal. What is this telling us? Well, I think this is a split hand appearance in motor neurone disease. And I think this reflects the large cortical representation of these areas in the brain. And I think this is a very important clue 
for us to try and better understand the condition. And so this was, this was first um, reported by a couple of groups. One was Satoshi Kuwabara um, in, uh, in Japan, dissociated muscle involvement. It's now become better known as the ALS split hand. And so a few months ago, we uh, actually had a meeting in, in New York, and I was accompanied by Martin Turner and Kevin Talbot, and we had to go to Yankee Stadium. And we were there um, getting our first supply of beer, which you usually do. And underneath, sorry, above where you got the beers, there was this picture of Gehrig. And uh, when we did have a closer look, um, you can see he's got the, um, an ALS split hand. And so in fact, so he started with left leg weakness, then it's gone to involve his, his left hand. And there are characteristic patterns of spread that are telling us what is happening um, with motor neurone disease. So really, what, it, what is the origin of ALS? And I think this has been a subject to debate, but I think it is becoming clearer that, I mean, people might think that it was more a neuromuscular condition and perhaps there was some retrograde approach and neurotoxicity. I think that's a, a more difficult argument to sustain at the moment, and I would say that probably more people are leaning towards a primary central process with anterograde excitotoxicity moving down to the anterior horn cell and somehow getting across both compartments of the nervous system. So that's called a, a dying forward approach. And it was really Andrew Weissen um, who has championed this over a long period of time. But in fact, the early writings of Charcot also raised this as the likely uh, process. So we've been quite interested in trying to work out what, what does come first. Where is it beginning? How is it spreading? And so we've been looking at patients, sporadic patients, but also looking at um, familial patients and individuals who have genetic mutations linked to motor neurone disease, but who are completely normal, and trying to basically interrogate the whole of their nervous system, so from the brain through to their peripheral axons. And we've been using transcranial magnetic stimulation to look at their brains, and um, this is, a, this is what is normal. So basically, if you give two pulses close to each other, you get a period of inhibition, followed by a period of facilitation. So that's normal. And when you study patients with motor neurone disease, we've now studied um, you know, more than 500 ALS patients, and there's a significant shift down. So the inhibition is lost, the facilitation is increased, so they're hyper-excitable. If you look at individuals who have familial motor neurone disease, from the clinical perspective, we, don't, we, can't, we can't distinguish who is familial or sporadic. It's only by knowing the family history. So on the clinical examination, they look exactly the same, and people have wondered whether they were the same diseases or not. And in fact, when you look at familial um, ALS, and these are SOD1 individuals, there's also evidence of, um, of cortical hyperexcitability, and that seems to correlate with peripheral involvement. But we weren't sure what was coming first. Um, was it the peripheral involvement or the central involvement? They were certainly linked. And uh, going back to Rilizol, we, um, it's funny, even though it's been around for such a long period of time, we're not really sure how it's working. And we know that it's having an effect by reducing glutamate release, um, but it also s seems as though it's working through sodium channels, both centrally and peripherally particularly persistent sodium conductances. And what we've been doing now is when we first diagnose a patient, then we study them, put them on to Rilizol, and when, when, when they get Rilizol, they get a pseudo-normalization. So it comes back towards normal, but it's not normal, and then gradually over time that still runs down. And eventually the cortex becomes relatively inexcitable as all of the corticospinal tract neurons are, are lost. So uh, actually we've been working with MagStim um, based here in Wales, and we're trying now to put all of the paradigms into um, the clinical equipment. So hopefully everyone can, can get a go at, at testing it, because I think this might be useful in terms of a functional marker. 